How many times have you heard politicians and pundits say, now more than ever, we need to stand vigilant as the forces of evil which work against us seek to subvert our way of life? How many times have you heard arguments, sentiments of disunity, of breaking apart, which drove populations into violent fervor against their so-called oppressors? How many times have you watched a movie that says something like, on the poster of the movie Fury by B Brad Pitt, or with Brad starring Brad Pitt, war never ends quietly. There are you. We have so many types of war that we talk about: culture war, economic war. We have um, ideological warfare, holy war, and so long and so forth. A war for economic means. And we've heard the quote uh, oftentimes stated that it's been attributed to von Clausewitz that war is politics by another means. And one of the inspirations, one of the many influences which led to the start of this podcast was the desire to use the internet to continue to put not necessarily faith in the human species, but to participate in it, to play our role as a member. And as the month of October rolls on, we are I'm going to be do, working on a couple of pieces that have to do with war, ideology, belief systems, and how we think about these things. Because while we grew up with movies and video games and, and books and novels and stories that highlighted war or used war as the centerpiece for a subject, we are now and always will be continually facing the question of what is war and what are we engaging in? Many of us who grew up in the church are familiar with the types of war imagery that are used in books written to men. There's a war against the family or a war against the church or a war against men. And be this idea, this claim that there is some sort of direct conflict being waged against us implies more than a few simple things. In fact, it has to be addressed in the framework of what we consider morality. One may ask, what is it that makes a thing moral or immoral? One may ask the question, of what is the nature of morality? One may ask the question of what it is that grounds our even understanding of morality or where does it come from? If my parents taught me this or that is right and this or that is wrong, where did they get that information? Where did they get that imperative? And we are very aware that forces of evil may seek to hide or mask their intent or their ultimate goals. This comes out in most fanciful ways like conspiracy theories or um, oppression narratives, but it also comes out in classic literature. C.S. Lewis is one of, one of C.S. Lewis's most famous books. The Screwtape Letters argues that one of the things that the devil did most effectively to, uh, to work against the people of mankind was to convince them that he didn't exist. But when we watch movies like Braveheart or Patriot, when we think about things like insurgency and guerrilla warfare, when we look at the ways that conflict has changed over time but also remained the same, we are again confronted with the challenge that it isn't so simple. One of the conveniences of a conventional war, a very clear and overt stated war declared by Congress and so forth, is that we know what the, we are fighting against, even if we're not entirely sure what we're fighting for. And we can complain until the cows come home, or we can complain until we are blue in the face, that it has been a long time since Congress has ever really declared war while we are engaged in conflict, and that is only matched with the humility or the revelation, or the understanding, or the ethical struggle with the challenge that we face, being what peace we experience in the United States comes at the cost of, is it unnamed heroes? Or is it subversive techniques used to cripple potential opposing parties? And so as, we or as, so as we continue in considering these things, today we're going to talk a little bit about different versions or different ideas of moral foundations, different ideas that have been presented in the past 
and how they affect how we think about the actions of ourselves and our peers. You see, it, you, you, at, the, the, at the beginning, I'm, I want to plant this question. Um, I want to. I want to plant an idea. I want to. I want to. I want to set set something at the base of uh, of this conversation, and then we're going to go and talk about Aristotelian ethics or Aristotelian virtue ethics, just a cursory concept. And then we're going to talk about utilitarianism, and then a little bit of Immanuel Kant. But we're going to just touch on those. And mind you, I'm not the world's most preeminent scholar in any of these fields, but it's something that we have. We, ha we can look back through history and recognize that other men and women have considered these things before. So we have to cover Augustine, we have to cover um, Aristotle, we have to cover utilitarianism, and then we have to cover Immanuel Kant. Um, and then we can get into today. But a commonality that you we experience something that or something that is said in politics all the time and and is somewhat difficult to handle is that we have more in common than we have apart from each other. And even if that is the case, isn't it contrasted by the issue that those things that make us different are perhaps more vital than the things that we see in common? The thing that I consider to be good, if you consider to be evil, doesn't really matter or, or that that has much more weight than the fact that we both enjoy a certain cuisine we both need food and water and shelter to survive but the things that divide us sit much closer to the core of who we are and is there resolution for that is there a way for us to solve it we've talked about that multiple times before when we talk about multiculturalism and so the idea that I want to start with the plant is, is how similar we might be between examples of right and left perspectives to civil conflict. But let's start with Aristotle. One of the things that Aristotle is most famous for saying is he's asked, what, is it, what does it mean to be virtuous? And the response is something like, well, it's what a virtuous man does. And then what is a virtuous man is the next following question, which leads to, well, it's a man who acts virtuously. It's kind of a circular argument. It's a virtuous man does what is virtuous, and virtue is what a virtuous man does. And while that may be frustrating as an argument format, what it does is it places some of the location, locus of morality in the acts of the individual as well as the actions themselves on a most negative standpoint it's a non-answer and, and a little bit more a little bit more positive recognizes that there's two parts there's two contributing factors at play when we're talking about whether or not a person's actions is moral so a virtuous thing be uh, another thing that aristotle brought to the table was the golden mean and this is the, the this is also described in other form, other ways of talking about staying out of the ditches. You have, on the one hand, uh, licentiousness and greed, and then the other hand, you have asceticism or the abandonment of all things. And some whatever is virtuous is really what sits between those. Virtue would be a balance between extremes. You don't want to be too violent or too passive. You don't want to be too greedy or too aloof. You don't want to be too... Uh, too arrogant or too weak or too humble is not even the right word. Um, too, uh, what's the other? What's another way of saying it? Too uh, introspective maybe is not the right way either. But it's sort of like that you don't want to be the nice guy or the bully. And this golden mean, this thing between two extremes, is how we identify virtue. And a virtuous man is a person who does those things. And so then a virtuous man or virtue being this balancing structure of looking at what we clearly identify as evils, evils that contrast one another um, in their extremes and find what is the appropriate middle ground between those two things. Now, Aristotle's writing was, has been influential throughout the West, including both Muslim and Christian cultures and beyond for thousands of years. Aristotle wrote before Jesus Christ was on the earth. And so we're looking at, you know, 20, 2,300-ish years at least, you know, 2,000, and you have at least that amount of time where Aristotle's impact on the West has been felt. Um, 
but then what are the challenges to the Aristotelian project as well? Are the I'm sorry, this Aristotelian approach to virtue is even in the way that I've described it now, which is not a complete picture, but a snapshot into Aristotelian virtue ethics, is that we have to be able to discern what is considered these extremes, these evils, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of them are more clear than others. Some of them are dis ascertained in different ways, but we want to be clear on how we think about those things. You could say that Aristotelian virtue ethics is more of a heuristic than it is a mechanical system. A heuristic being a rule of thumb, as the saying goes, and is, if you want to dig deep into heuristics, I suggest reading Anti-Fragile by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. <clears throat> and another, so then we have that one. That is one system. Um, we've, we're going to continue to talk. I have to go much deeper into St. Augustine's Just War Theory in the future because it is something that even where I'm at right now, I wish to become more educated, more informed, and more well-read on the subject before I speak authoritatively on it. But it is from this argument, it is from the idea that a war can be justified that we get the, the distinction between juice ad bellum and juice in bello. Juice ad bellum being a the justifications for going to war, and juice in bellum is just actions in war. I've talked about this in the past, and I think it is one of the single most important elements that we as citizens and individuals in gun culture can consider, because if we want to claim to live in a society as individuals, then we have to accept the responsibility of understanding these things and something that I believe and would wish to put forward continuously into our community, encouragement to you as such, is that more people are interested in this and not talking about it than people who are not interested in it and not concerned with these things, but still willing to wield them. This is an optimistic point of view towards at least the gun culture in America. But we need to move on to utilitarianism, and utilitarianism, put simply, is something like the ends justify the means. An ends justify the means scenario, meaning if I have to sacrifice one person's well-being to maybe save a thousand or a million people, then I can consider it justified because I, I say, well, the one cost is less than the great gain. And there are a plethora of challenges to this worldview or this ethical system. However, it one thing that it does bring to the table is it helps us simplify some complex arguments. I don't think it would be safe to consider utilitarianism an end-all and universal worldview that functions effectively, and, I, and one argument for that is it has already failed in the past and will continue to fail in the future, but it is something of more of a tool that we can use to look at what are the pros and cons, the outcomes and the costs and the consequences of doing said action. For example, if you break down a dam that causes one village to lose its property because it is covered down, it is, it is, it is surrounded, it is submerged, but that water that was otherwise held in a reservoir allows 10 more villages to flourish isn't the utility the utility advantage of removing that of that structure it considered good we 10 families 100 families might lose their homes but a thousand families will continue to live on and gain from this you are now picking your you are now seeing the issue of the playing god that might happen here where in a utilitarian example, if taken to extremes, starts to see one as the arbiter of morality. And this fell apart as the Enlightenment carried on, and it was challenged by other people too, because even Immanuel Kant, as another famous philosopher has addressed, the intentions of the individual come to play. Now, Kantian ethics uh, his deontology of ethics and the idea of the universal, uh, let's see, is it universal imperative? I think that's the right way of saying it. I'm now I'm blanking because I'm recording, and you know that's what happens. But one thing that it, one of the ways that Immanuel Kant's more our moral system was kind of simplified is if it is good for everyone to do it, if it is something good in all in all cases for all people to do, then we can say it's good. For example, 
uh, that where the challenging point might be lying. Famously stating in a in a in um in an intellectual game because Immanuel Kant came before this time, but it was later used is if you lived in say a country that was persecuting a certain population on arbitrary grounds, Germany and the Jews as as, as an example, and we say lying is evil. What happens if you lie to those who are hunting other people to in order to save them? I mean, you, you essentially lie to the Nazis to save the Jews, uh, and you, you you have a safe house in your basement, and and there's a, a Jewish family that you're protecting from uh, Nazi persecution, and well, persecution is a light way of saying it, um, and so as a result, you lie to the Nazis in order to save the people that you are safe harboring in your basement. So this is where this is a this is a very sort of rudimentary argument that's brought up against Immanuel Kant because the idea here in in the argument it, that Immanuel Kant is dealing with in this ethics structure is how do we understand that which is good? One way we might say it is if it is it is always good for all people to do it all the time, then we can say that it is a good thing. That's a very 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 aggressive simplification of it, and I need I should I should do a full episode on Immanuel Kant's uh, ethics. So now we've got two. We got a lot of homework stacking up, don't we? We've got Augustine's just war theory. We've got Immanuel Kant, and now, but one thing that I think that you can one one way that we can look at these different elements is we can draw essentially a line, a chain between. Uh, we can draw a line and look at where we had, we would place morality on that line. For example, is it the individual doing the action that makes it moral? Yes or no. Well, you have a little bit of Aristotelian ethics. Is it that person's act? Uh, is it that person's actions that make an, a thing moral? Yes or no? Well, what happens if his actions turn out to be good, but he intended to do evil? We'll get onto that later. So the outcome of the action. So so you have the individual. You have the actions they make. They you have the outcome, and then you have um, the intent. So in this line here if it's the individual that makes a thing good good people do good things bad people do bad things we place the locus of morality on the individual now what about if the actions well good people are good because they do good things performative morality uh what then we would determine is morality is based in the in the action it's not just it's not the person good people are good people because they do good things but how do we determine whether a, an action is good or evil? Well, one of the ways that we can look at it is by its outcome. Then you, know, you have something like utilitarianism here. If the outcome is good, then the actions were good. If the outcome is bad, then the actions were bad. Then you run to the next question, which it, the next problem is, well, what happens if the person intends to do evil, but the outcome is good? The person is, so we have a person who are trying to determine whether or not they are good or not, does an action, which we want to try, to try to determine whether or not the action is good or not. And then we look at the outcome and we recognize that the outcome is not sufficient, but it is part of the answer. And then we have to ask the question of the intent because people intending to do evil, accidentally accomplishing good, do they get the credit of doing that which is good? No. We are thankful, like for example, in the Old Testament story, when God uses the uh, uses the life of J uh, Joseph, yeah, Joseph and Joseph and the and, and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat as the uh, the 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 was it the TV show or the play or whatever the story comes out of. But in the Old Testament, something that was intended for evil, that where uh, Joseph was uh, sold into slavery by his own brothers, ends up getting ends up being transported to Egypt, where there remaining faithful to God, he is persecuted for his actions until he finds himself in the seat of power second only to the pharaoh of that country and because of his position and what was what information was made available to him by the revelation of God, he saves the basically the country of Egypt and even his family from an oncoming famine. So the intentions of the brothers were to do evil, but the outcome ultimately was good, depending on how far you stretched out. Now, is are you saying that, well, the, the brothers intended to do evil and they accomplished the evil by selling him into slavery? Yes, but the evil that was intended by the brothers to sell their brother into slavery ends up in that brother in a situation where he is able to do good, including good against those who sold him into slavery. 
what a what a power well, not even a power trip but what a scenario that must be to be in the position where you were persecuted and oppressed not even oppressed you were sold into slavery by your own family and then through those actions you were able to rescue them from the famine strange times um but that's nothing new right and 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 what we're concerned here circling back to the beginning of what started this conversation is that one thing that we would like to one thing that we recognize is that not everything is overt <clears throat> One of the challenges with warfare that we face, both today and through history, is that it's not as cleanly directed as the storybooks say. Not everything is a finely tell told fantasy or a dark fantasy story of like Warhammer 40,000 and its grim dark future. The lines are not so easily drawn even in... And the, and, and the, li oh, the lines are not so easily drawn in our world and we have to deal with different types of conflict. One would have to ask the question, where is the line of distinction between war and peace? We might know what open, clear warfare looks like, and we may know that there can be activities that are warlike in their description, but don't quite qualify as conventional or open warfare. And as our culture expands and grows, and I mean our culture as in the United States continues to gain more population, or the world does as well, as we see populations move, na stateless nations, nationless states, we see <clears throat> our nationality, you know, states lacking nationality, um, something like that. You, you have all these different challenges. Uh, the we, we we find ourselves having to use discernment to consider what is considered. Or we have we have to use discernment to sift through what kind of actions we are encountering and what the right response is. So I said earlier, and I wanted, and I started this beginning of this podcast with this question of what is what what is a similarity when it comes to conflict that we see between the right and the left in American politics, and that is something like both the right and the left can have have something built into their mythos if that's the right way of saying it that has to do with a justified use of force against an attacker now the right is very overt about this in the sense of self-defense but we have a gaining we have a growing yawning pro not even yawning it's a yaw w-a-y no Y A W yaw. We have this gap, this maw, this this tearing and breaking uh, force at work within the world that we live in, which is that the conventions of the old world no longer apply in the same way as the conventions of today. You'll hear it said that the uh, that the it, it that that the Chinese government has been tacitly accused of engaging in economic warfare against the United States by sending precursor chemicals to non-state actors within the Mexican cartel who make a profit off of selling a drug that kills Americans. And if the Chinese government is fully aware of this, do we actually consider that action warfare? They are not the first person, the first line of action being made. They're not the ones there doing the thing. They're not even selling the drug to the Americans. But are they aware of the consequences of their actions and where its impact is being made? The left likes to think about world in narratives of oppressor and oppressed and seeing the oppressed as some sort of Star Wars Jedi-like, or if you want to see a new movie, the creator attitude of, well, the bad guys are just the bad guys of the empire, and they're bad because they're oppressing the good guys, and the good guys have all the good virtues, but they're also good by their nature of being oppressed. Kind of a crazy way of thinking, but it is what it is. Whereas the right also holds onto this mentality that there is something that is real, and it's being attacked, and eventually that attack, that attack level will reach a height where the right is justified in using force. This is, I hope we're starting to see a little bit of that similarity play out. The right sees it in the sense of, you see this talk, you see this conversation happening in, um, not it's not as overt as it's given credit by pundits and ac accusers, but there's a tendency within something like the gun culture to say, you know, in the event that I am attacked, I will use force to defend myself. 
and then they believe themselves justified in doing that. The left, then, in literature like Malcolm Nance or the Antifa Handbook or Barbara F. Walters in her writing on um, how civil wars start, argues something a little bit more like preemptive self-defense, where I know that you're going to attack me, and so I have the right to use force to defend myself. Hence, we see riots in the streets and burning of buildings and all forms of that low-level, low-tier violence. Another way that it was described to me that I think was really well done is that the right thinks of violence as an on-off switch and the left thinks of violence as a, as a spectrum or a gauge. And ultimately, why we are talking about this on a podcast and we're having a conversation with one another and why we are engaging with this within the concept of gun culture or within the context of gun culture is because fundamentally at our core, we are concerned first and foremost with doing that which is moral, not which is expedient. Ultimately, we know that there's a difference between that which is legal and that which is moral. We know that there's a difference between that which is right and wrong and that which is permitted and not permitted by a governing body. We know that there's a distinction there, and one of them leads to one of them has a, a very immediate impact on our life, but the other one has a much deeper impact on who we are. We not only want to do the right thing and keep our family alive, we want to do so in a legal method, we also want to do so in a moral method. And if the legal system makes that which is virtuous prohibited, then we, have, we want to have a mechanism by which we correct that. And the complexity of war does not make it easy. You may hear yourself spoken to often today that there is a war being waged against X. But the question you have to follow up with must, in every case, at every time, is so what? If there is a war being waged against you, what are the rules of engagement and what are the rules of morality that you get to use? Because once you say that there's a war being waged against you, as we've traced this path through different ethical systems, what is a virtuous man? What is a, well, how do we determine an action? And then whether or not that action through utility and that action's utility isn't alone, rather there's intent. And in our perfect world scenario where we get to have evil oppressors and oppressed or evil corporations, we get to say that we have determined that their actions or maybe we have assumed that their intent is evil and their actions are following through with it. And therefore, we are going to use whatever it is. What is the appropriate response, the ethical response? And this is where we're going to get into the subject of one of the things that I like to do in our media which is, you know, we like to hide some things. We, get, we like to make things cryptic and reward you for engaging with us and spending time in the podcast or spending time with us through the different things that we're working through. And this year is October, or this October, and now we are going to be bringing about Moons Haunted 2.0. And when we launched that, I, when we launched that originally, we liked, I like to bury little things into it and what people will ask well what's the point of moons haunted and we'll get, we're going to be exploring that in the coming months i'm sorry in the coming weeks because it's just going to be in october so to tie this whole thing together what the right and the left are equally struggling with or seem to be struggling with and what they have in common is that they that they are trying to figure out or neglecting to try to figure out how to answer a specific question which is relevant to our day. And that is, what do we do when the actions of some a group of people or the actions of an individual in, within our environment are openly and clearly malicious but not clearly illegal. When somebody is engaging in a form in an action or an activity which could be described as something like economic warfare, but they're doing so by legal means. How do we address that? How do we change that? What are the redress of grievances and how do we live morally? It's not so much to say that, well, or one of the allures, one of the trappings, one of the vices buried within a vengeance system or a oppressor oppressed narrative or a virtuous but impeded society argument and worldview is that once that threshold is crossed you get to believe that all 
door all um you know all uh was it all bars are released all 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 bets are off all you know like all prohibitions are dissolved once we get into open civil conflict there is nothing preventing people from committing atrocities on one another and we don't want that world but where does that idea come from where do we ground it how do we believe in it one of the one of the temptations i think i have it written down but one of the it, there's a temptation When it comes to talk of war, we will be tempted to indulge in the urgency open conflict implies. And as the sugar high fades, remaining complacent, we will begin to frantically search for another hit of dopamine in the form of a story, concept, or prediction that justifies our desired feeling of urgency. One thing that talk of war brings to the table is urgency. So... Don't let your sense of urgency be hijacked by meaningless statements, meaningless predictions with no value added afterwards. Don't allow yourself to be carried away by the devil who is working hard to convince you that he's not there. This is just a warning on top of many other things, but what we and how we are going to continue to engage in that is by looking at our ideas. So in closing, in summary, in conclusion, we are in the month of October. The our 2024 is barreling down upon us. There's turmoil in the Senate and the ATF has set a, has has made a declaration that a company called utm is not allowed to sell their non-lethal training ammunition to civilians and we have to ask ourselves is this economic warfare and if that if it is true so what if we are not going to if we know that we are not going to engage in open conflict because there are no standing armies there isn't this nice american civil war-esque appearance we might want to ask ourselves what is the right way to live our lives and are we blinding ourselves are we selling our souls for a sense of urgency? If the answer is no, how then shall we live? What is a due proper pro a recourse against or opposing or correcting the actions of the ATF and how will we go on in our lives? We've seen it happen in the past. We see people like the Firearms Policy Co Coalition going to lawfare, going to legal warfare for the sake of the American people. And that is not the end of it. We must continue going forward. And some of that is that through spreading culture, having communications, building a community, sharing this podcast. Thank you very much. I need that. And spending our time encouraging one another. So don't be shy. Say nice things to your friends. And as we close, this is the Redacted Culture Cast. You can stay tuned. You're gonna, we're going to be releasing this, the new version of Moons Haunted on the website real soon. The t-shirts are on their way to my house. The uh, sh the sweat the, the the sweaters. The, I'm sorry. The 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 t-shirts are on their way out already. The hoodies are on their way. So stay tuned. Watch your mailbox. And if you want to pick up one of the shirts to support the show, you can head over to redactedllc.com, and they should be available soon. That being the case, go forth and conquer. <laughs>